From the 7th to the 8th of December, 1941, an apocalyptic onslaught began to sweep across East Asia as the Imperial Japanese military launched a grand, multi-fronted offensive in the region. Famously, the US Navy base at Pearl Harbor was targeted on this day, but also were the Philippines, British Malaya, Thailand, the Dutch East Indies, numerous smaller islands across the Pacific, and British Hong Kong. This vast campaign was simply put, devastating. In Pearl Harbor, 19 US Navy ships had been damaged or destroyed. The Philippines fell in five months, Malaya in two, Thailand in less than a day, the Dutch East Indies in three months, and those numerous small islands also in a matter of days. As for Hong Kong, it didn't even last three weeks, with the vastly outnumbered and outgunned defenders, valiant defense finally breaking on Christmas Day when they were forced to raise the white flag. For the British, this wasn't just a defeat. It was a humiliation. An unfortunate fact that has made the Battle of Hong Kong, or rather how we should consider it in the modern day, a very contentious point among historians. So today we are going to be deep diving right into the deep end of this argument, not only presenting the story of the battle, but also diving into this wider discourse so that you, dear audience, can not only know about the battle, but can begin to understand it. So let's jump in. Now, to truly understand the invasion of Hong Kong, we must first trace the confluence of economic, political, and military trends that culminated in the battle. In 1941, the British Empire, the largest empire the world has ever seen, was the preeminent power in the world. Hong Kong, a crown colony since 1842 following the Treaty of Nanking, was a symbol of this power in East Asia and a bustling international trade hub. Located off of China's southern coast, however, the colony's strategic location made it both an asset and a vulnerability. A great place to trade and station warships, but very, very far from home and surrounded by increasingly powerful nations. Nations such as Japan, which in parallel to the British Empire's high noon was emerging as a dominant force in East Asia. The Meiji Restoration of 1868 had set the island nation on a rapid course of modernization and industrialization, and victories in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 to and the annexation of Korea in 1910 had given it a whiff of imperial ambition, an aroma that Japan found oh so palatable. By the 1930s, Japan had shifted its imperial gaze towards mainland China, driven by a quest for resources and the supposed ethos of Pan-Asianism, which advocated for Asian liberation from Western colonial rule, but under Japanese leadership, of course. Manchuria, a region in northeastern China, was first to be targeted, falling under Japanese control in 1932 after being invaded the previous year. But this was just a bit of a starter for the Japanese palace, and it wouldn't be until 1937 when they attempted to fully satisfy their hunger for Chinese land, beginning a full-scale invasion of China proper after the Marco Polo Bridge incident. This initially went well for Japan, and its military swept down the coast of China, which in turn soon brought it face to face with the Western powers, its new borders meeting those of British Hong Kong and Portuguese Macau on the southern coast. Trade embargoes from the West soon followed as a response to Japanese aggression with the United States, Britain, and the Netherlands imposing severe economic sanctions, including a critical oil embargo. Japan, reliant on imports for its industrial economy, viewed these embargoes as a stranglehold, and soon it began to consider more direct solutions to sourcing its precious oil. These considerations were only strengthened by the ongoing international situation, as by 1941 Europe was in turmoil, the Netherlands had fallen, and Britain appeared to be about to imminently share the same fate. There likely would never have been a better time to strike at the European colonies in Asia, and so if Japan was serious about taking the resources it needed by force, the time was now. Such an expansion was certainly not without risks, however, and so Japan devised a bold, multi-pronged strategy to simultaneously strike at multiple territories in the Pacific, intended to completely take them out of the picture in one go. Thus, Hong Kong found itself in Japan's crosshairs. The colony itself had little to no resources worth claiming, but if Japan was serious about throwing the Europeans out of the Pacific, leaving the British a staging post that led straight into the soft underbelly of its Chinese holdings, certainly didn't seem prudent. Plus, Hong Kong was one of the best developed ports in the region. Claiming it for themselves certainly wasn't going to harm the Japanese war effort. And so the die was cast. Japanese troops began massing on the border in early December and began staring at the calendar, waiting for it to turn over to the 8th. 
Gode. Now, leading the offensive was Lieutenant General Tai Kaishai Sakai, a seasoned officer with years of experience commanding troops in China under his belt. Under his command were 26,928 troops, most of them hardened veterans with their own fair share of experience fighting in China. Supporting his efforts in the sky were 47 planes, and at sea he had access to one cruiser, three destroyers, four torpedo boats, and three small gunboats. Opposing Sakai in defense was Major General Christopher Michael Maltby, commander of the British forces, himself also a seasoned officer, having served both on the Western Front during World War I and in India during the interwar years. He was no armchair general either, as attested to by him being awarded the Military Cross for gallantry and thrice being mentioned in dispatches during World War I. Under his command was a modest 14,564 troops. His was a most diverse force, comprised of Brits from the Royal Scots and Middlesex regiments, Canadians from the Royal Rifles of Canada and Winnipeg Grenadiers, Indians from the 7th Rajput and 14th Punjab regiments, and of course, Chinese, split between the Hong Kong Chinese regiments and Hong Kong Volunteer Defense Corps. Unfortunately for Maltby, unlike Sakai, many of his troops were unproven in combat. Some, like the Royal Scots, had fought in France in 1940, but others, like the 14th Punjabs, hadn't seen combat since World War I, with only some of its senior officers having any combat experience at all. As for supporting units, Maltby only had access to five planes, one destroyer, four gunboats, and eight motor torpedo boats. Maltby was well aware that the Japanese were planning an attack. Both his own border forces and intelligence from occupied China had reported a significant buildup of Japanese troops around Shenzhen. The question wasn't if, but when. And his answer? Well, that came at 4.45 a.m. on the 8th of December, when Radio Tokyo proclaimed a thing most chilling across the airwaves of Asia. To quote, we hereby declare war on the United States of America and the British Empire. Now, Maltby was no fool. He quickly put two and two together and deduced that the Japanese attack was imminent, and within 15 minutes of the declaration of war, his engineers were frantically at work in the new territories, blowing up all the key infrastructure they could, while they still could, with orders to retreat once the Japanese came into sight. They had little more than an hour, as at 6 a.m. the invasion began. The Japanese strategy at this point was simple. The 228th, 229th, and 230th Infantry Regiments would spearhead the assault down through Kowloon, with the 228th taking the eastern route, the 229th the center, and the 230th the west. As they advanced, an air raid was launched on Kai Tak Airport, the base of Maltby's meager aerial forces at 8 a.m. The attack was quick, and it was devastating. In only one sortie, a squadron of four G3M medium bombers and eight Kawasaki Ki-32 light bombers had completely destroyed all five of Maltby's aircraft and rendered the airport completely inoperable. Not that the air forces stationed there would have made much of a difference anyway, only consisting of two Supermarine Walrus Maritime Patrol aircraft and three Vickers Wildebeest torpedo bombers, both chronically obsolete types that would have been little concern for the Japanese, even if they didn't grossly outnumber but them. Maltby's forces did have some initial successes in repelling Sakai's initial push, with the 14th Punjab successfully holding back the 228th's advance in Taipo district to the east, but unfortunately the success was not uniform across the front, and oh, with the 229th rapidly pushing deep into the new territories, the 14th were forced to withdraw lest they be encircled and completely destroyed. They escaped by the skin of their teeth, only narrowly avoiding encirclement, and so Maltby, eager to preserve his forces, forbid any more full frontal engagements that day, and instead ordered his forces to harry the Japanese with hit and run star tactics to slow their advance and make a full retreat to Gin Drinker's Line when the sun went down. Now, Gin Drinker's Line was a fortified defensive line that spanned 18 kilometers across the new territory's thinnest point. And if the name is conjuring up images of the Maginot Line in your minds, well, disregard those thoughts, because rather than an impenetrable wall of bombproof concrete, Gin Drinker's Line instead was a series of very small bunkers, pillboxes, and fortified machine gun posts, all interconnected by mostly dirt trenches that had been knocked together between 1936 and 1938. But it was better than nothing, and Maltby reasoned it would would be his best choice of delaying the Japanese advance and holding out. Hong Kong's defense strategy of the time was to delay any potential attack until reinforcements could arrive. But tragically for Maltby, he was completely unaware that the whole of East Asia was currently in the same situation as him, and so, well, no help was going to be coming. The 9th of December saw a desperate attempt to hold Gin Drinker's Line. The Royal Scots, 7th Rajputs, and Hong Kong Volunteer Defense Corps took their positions across strategic points. 
After facing a surprisingly valiant defense throughout the day and failing to penetrate the line, Sakai decided to cut the head off the snake and ordered the 228th to launch a surprise attack on Xing Meng Redoubt, the most fortified bunker on the line, in the dead of the night with all their numbers. The attack was absolutely devastating, and under the weight of hundreds of grenades and tens of thousands of bullets, the redoubt fell under Japanese control in the early hours of the 10th. The rest of the 10th consisted of Mobi desperately trying to hold the rest of Jin Drinker's line and retake Xing Meng Redoubt, with the Royal Scots being chosen to lead the assault to retake it. But it was to no avail. Lieutenant Colonel White, the officer in command of the Royal Scots, reported back to Maltby that it would be nothing short of suicide to attempt to retake the redoubt, and he refused to attack. Consequently, the day ended with the line fully in Japanese control. The fortification that was designed to buy Maltby at least a week of breathing space had barely lasted a day. The 11th was back to old form for Maltby, i.e. desperately trying to do whatever he could to slow down the Japanese advance to the southern tip of Kowloon as he just delayed the inevitable. Fighting was fierce across the whole front, with the 7th Rajputs and Royal Scots even managing to repel the Japanese for a time at Kam Shan, but victories like this were certainly the exception to the rule, and Maltby had to accept the unfortunate fact that the Kowloon Peninsula was lost. And that acceptance came just after midday, when he called for a full retreat from the peninsula, with all forces to retreat across Victoria Harbour to Hong Kong Island itself. What followed over the next two days was a fighting retreat to Sim Sa Soi on the southern tip of Kowloon with British units simply trying to preserve their numbers and put up just enough of a resistance to stop themselves being completely overwhelmed as they headed south. To begin with, the evacuation was calm enough, with the first units to arrive, such as the Winnipeg Grenadiers, being evacuated across the harbour via the Star Ferry in conditions that could be described almost as leisurely. But this situation quickly broke down as the Japanese advance rolled over on, with the last unit to cross the 7th Rajputs making a fierce scramble for anything that floated, be it ferry, sampan, or anything in between. This all was happening as Japanese bullets rained over them from only a few streets away. Ultimately, however, by daybreak on the 13th, all forces had been evacuated across the harbor and the final stage of the battle could begin. So, on the morning of the 13th, Maltby, with the burden of command heavy on his shoulders, took a moment to review the situation. He knew the confines of Hong Kong Island were his last fortress against the relentless Japanese tide. But luckily, he reasoned, Hong Kong Island was at least a literal fortress as well as a proverbial one. It was mountainous, rugged, and characterized by a maze of urban structures. The island was a bit of a defensive dream. If held correctly, it had the potential to become the Japanese's worst nightmare. Now, Sakai recognized this fact, and rather than sending his forces storming across the bay, he instead opted to set up artillery along the waterfront to soften the island up, bombarding key targets before assaulting it proper. Initially, this was focused on large targets, the enormous fort-mounted naval guns that could do some real damage if left unchecked. This proved largely successful, and by the close of the 14th, many of the 9.2-inch and 3-inch guns that dawned Mount Davis had been destroyed. Then, with that threat largely neutralized, the Japanese artillery moved to target pillboxes and other small fortifications alongside the shoreline. They also launched six separate air raids against military sites on the west side of the island, forcing Pinewood Battery and its many guns to be abandoned. While this bombardment was underway, the Japanese were trying to negotiate the surrender of the British garrison, sending delegations across the harbor on the 13th and 17th, both of which were politely told to go away. On the 18th, with Hong Kong Islands being nicely softened up and it being quite apparent that a surrender was not going to be forthcoming, the Japanese decided that enough was enough and they launched an amphibious assault across the harbor in the dead of the night, making land at North Point. They quickly secured a foothold and penetrated further into the islands, with the 229th and 230th reaching Causeway Bay and the Wong Nai Chong Gap, respectively, by the time day broke. This advance threatened to cut the island in half, a situation that Mobby could not allow to happen, and so he hastily ordered a counterattack, sending the Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles of Canada to retake the vital ground. The resulting fight was nothing short of brutal, with close quarters combat unfolding tree by tree as they pushed into Wong Nai Chung Gap and eventually street by street as they pushed into Wong Nai Chung Village itself. Eventually, however, the British were repelled and the Japanese held onto the gap, thus setting a tragic precedent that would echo across the remainder of the battle. The Japanese would push the British further back, take yet another key strategic location. The British would attempt to counterattack, occasionally find some fleeting success, but ultimately fail to hold it. And Hong Kong Island, well, it's not exactly enormous. Maltby could only keep this up for so long until he reached breaking point. And that breaking point came 
on Christmas Day. Mobby was down to about 4,000 men, and having recently been given the heartbreaking news that no help was coming, he decided enough was enough. He raised the white flag, rather than see all of his men slaughtered, trying to delay the inevitable. He ordered his men to lay down their arms, and approached a Japanese officer to discuss the terms of surrender. Shortly afterwards, he found himself in the Japanese headquarters on the third floor of the Peninsula Hotel, the very hotel whose bar he had often frequented before the invasion, and he surrendered in person to Sakai. This ended the Battle of Hong Kong 17 days after it had begun, and gave Hong Kong, the British Crown Colony, to an invader. So, listening through our narrative of the Battle of Hong Kong, you're probably struck by the ever-present sense of inevitability that permeated the battle. The idea that no matter what Maltby or his soldiers did, it wasn't a question of if they would lose, but when. Now, this naturally raises a question. Was the British defeat actually inevitable? And if so, well, why? Now, to answer this question, what we want to do is seek the Council of Historians and see what they have to say, beginning with Philip Snow, who authored the book The Fall of Hong Kong, Britain, China, and the Japanese Occupation. For him, the British defeat was caused by catastrophic misjudgments rooted in arrogance. He explains this further by stating that the British underestimated Japanese military prowess, a blunder manifest in the fact that Hong Kong's garrison was ill-prepared for a confrontation of such magnitude. He also points to Jindrinka's lie, which the British had three years to further improve, and yet completely failed to do so. Stephen R. McKinnon takes a similar view, but lays the blame not at Jindrinka's line specifically, but in the British military's rigid doctrine generally, arguing that had they considered other tactical options such as guerrilla warfare, Maltby might have at least prolonged his defense, if not changed the outcome entirely. In parallel with this train of thought, some historians believe that British complacency led to a diminishment of potential reinforcements, it being argued that there existed an opportunity to garner greater support from Commonwealth allies or even entertain the thought of American aid. Such support might have bought the defenders additional time, potentially stalling the Japanese advance and leaving room for diplomatic maneuvers. Now, not everyone is this optimistic, and many think that regardless of how the British tweaked their strategy and tactics, Hong Kong was inevitably doomed. One such thinker is Rana Mitter, a leading historian on Asia during World War II, who often emphasizes the undeniable strengths of the Japanese military apparatus at that time. He argues that the Japanese forces, having accumulated experience and tactics, tactical acumen from their ongoing war in China were a formidable adversary. Their strategies were refined, and they enjoyed a clear numerical superiority. Given these advantages, Mitter argues that the British, even with better preparation, would have faced a Herculean task in repelling the Japanese onslaught. And then there's Antony Bavour, renowned for his sweeping accounts of World War II. For Bavour, the British Empire was grappling with challenges on a global scale, battling the Axis powers on multiple fronts from North Africa to Southeast Asia. Given these expansive commitments, Hong Kong was but one of many concerns, and resources were just inevitably spread thin. Bivor suggests that even if the British had committed more resources to Hong Kong's defense, they might have inadvertently weakened their position elsewhere, leading to potential defeats and more catastrophic losses in other critical theaters. Additionally, some argue that the geographical realities of Hong Kong's location presented a strategic dilemma. Christopher Bailey points to the colony's proximity to Japanese-occupied territories in China. This closeness afforded the Japanese logistical advantages, such as shorter supply lines and the ability to amass troops rapidly. Hong Kong's location was, in Bailey's view, a significant disadvantage for the British. And then there are the voices of those who were actually there, many of whom had a profound feeling of betrayal. For example, Sergeant George MacDonald of the Royal Rifles of Canada wrote the following in his memoirs. Hong Kong was an isolated, unprepared military death trap. If the Japanese attacked, we had two options. We could die on the battlefield or become prisoners of a savage enemy. And such opinions aren't purely retroactive either. Many felt during this battle, as attested to by Georges Ferreau of the Royal Rifles of Canada on the 19th of December 1941, to quote, We're caught like rats with no hope of escape. I'll probably never see my old Montreal again. Ultimately then, if nothing else, the debate over whether Hong Kong could have been saved is multifaceted, encapsulating a range of perspectives that encompass strategic miscalculations, geopolitical constraints, and the sheer unpredictability of warfare. Some historians suggest missed opportunities and alternative tactics that could have changed Hong Kong's fate, while others argue that the broader context made the colonies fall, if not inevitable, then highly probable. And this just leaves us with one question. What do you think? Look, however one interprets it, 
the Battle of Hong Kong sent ripples that were deeply felt, not just in military circles, but in the very fabric of the city's society. With the British forces defeated, the once vibrant metropolis entered a new dark chapter under Japanese occupation. For the next three years and eight months, the torture, ill-treatment, and brutalization of civilians, soldiers, and prisoners of war became routine, darkening the skies of the Pearl of the Orient. It's hard to explain the true extent of Japanese brutality in microcosm, but let us try by presenting you with a single fact. In 1941, Hong Kong's population stood at 1,639,000. By 1945, it was 600,000. Perhaps then, given the great tragedy that befell the colony, it's all the more important that we not only have a surface level understanding, the dates, the people, which regiment went where, and did what, etc., but instead strive for a deeper understanding of the battle. So with that in mind, let's return to that promise that I made you right at the start of the video and put your understanding to the test. Having now heard the story of the battle, why it began, how it played out, and the opinions of historians and veterans, do you think it's fair to consider it a humiliation? Do you think Hong Kong could have been saved? Do you think the men sent to defend it were thrown to the dogs? Ultimately, what we think here at Aura Graphics is a bit irrelevant. The purposes of this video is not to impart our opinion onto you, but rather to lead you, our viewers, to a place where you can begin to make your own informed opinions on it. After all, history, or rather, our interpretations of it, are incredibly subjective matter, and there are no right or wrong answers, only different opinions. So let us know what you think in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.